All right, so uh, Penny Mache, a novel system for executing scientific papers. Um, essentially, we had developed something recently. Elsevier had an executable paper challenge um, asking for um, different ideas about how to make papers executable or, in this context, um, you know, have reproducible research. So uh, me and my students, we put together um, a proof of concept, and I'll talk a little bit um, about that concept here. All right, so I wanted to start and just kind of go back and really think about, you know, why do we write scientific papers? And certainly when I'm thinking about writing a scientific paper, um, I'm usually thinking about reporting new results and relating those results um, to previous knowledge. Um, but we also may write papers so that we can go to different conferences in various nice locations like Vancouver. Uh, we may write papers to keep our jobs, right? We like actually live in houses instead of cardboard boxes. Um, we also have to give re reviewers something to do, right? So I don't know if you're like me, but a lot of times I write a paper I think is really good. You get this criticism and you feel like, you know, where do they come from? Um, but the other thing in terms of why we're here is that so that others can verify and experiment with what we have discovered. And one of the things about reproducibility, and you guys have talked about that a lot um, already, is at the moment, this has to be a conscious decision. So if you don't make a decision for your research to be reproducible, it will not be. Um, just in terms of the kind of um, environments and tools and complications that computation have, if you don't want your research to be reproducible, it will not be. Okay. So, reproducibility, though, is a major tenet of the scientific method, right? So if we say that we're doing science or we're doing the scientific method, our research must, in fact, be reproducible as well as do some level of predictability. So the difficulty here, right, relies on the fact that we're using software to um, do some of our methodology. And on top of that, for whatever reason, scientists are re reluctant to share um, his or her, her data um, and code. The other aspect of reproducibility, since it is quite difficult, is that it's actually unappreciated. So if I were to go and reproduce someone's results, it's not like I can go and put that on my CV, right? And so it's not that I need to put it on my CV, but in the, the fact is, what is the incentive, right? And so the other thing is, um, which I don't know if we talked about this um, at the workshop, but how reproducible must a result be in order for it to be considered validated? So this is the question I think I'll focus a bit more on in my talk, and I'll try to address it from two different uh, perspectives. All right, so we have these data and code repositories, and they, in fact, do encourage reproducibility. So you can think of it from the data perspective. There's something called Dryad, which actually has a relationship with many different journals. Uh, you may be familiar with this if you've come from more of the biological um, discipline. So Dryad, for example, um, says if you do anything with biology or, or whatever that particular question you're trying to address, then you need to deposit your uh, code I'm sorry, your data in this repository. And this data actually gets a DOI, a, what is it, digital object identifier, so that it does have a tag um, so that people can actually look for the data as it relates to this digital object identifier. Um, and there's GenBank and other kinds of data repositories that may be more specific to the particular discipline. And then there's certainly repositories uh, for handling code. All right. So the thing is, and we've talked about this already, right, that we certainly have source code, and it is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And you guys have really talked all about what the issue is, um, although I would say probably the biggest issue is number one, um, that there's still a lot of papers out there that are not uh, giving, making their source code available. And even if you read a paper and it says source code available upon request, that probably means it's not available, right? Um, <laughs> Um, you know, so don't request it. <laughs> um, and so, in any case, um, that's sort of where we, where we are. And I won't go through this anymore, but you guys have talked about this. We've already talked about a lot of different solutions for this problem. Um, but again, still, even though it's not sufficient, we still do need this as a, as a first step. But I'm a lazy scientist. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not afraid to admit that. And so the thing is, is I really, after I write source code, I don't really want to do more with my source code. And the thing is, I don't really want to install someone else's source code on my machine. It's just a big time commitment. So it'd be great if I could just try the software before I made a huge commitment to actually install it on my machine. 
And, you know, if I'm a reviewer, for example, um, maybe all I want to know is, okay, this looks really good. I wonder how it, did they really try it on this data? Or what does it look like on this data? Or did they try with my favorite parameters? And at that point, I might be satisfied. So the question for me is, is there an easy way for me to answer this question quickly? Right? I don't really want to make a big investment in time. Right? I don't want to commit. All right. So that's sort of where our paper mache comes in, which we really think of it more as an approach for managing scientific papers. Okay. So in this paper mache system, um, essentially we have three entities, authors, reviewers, and readers. Right? And really what we'd like for this to do with these three people is actually to have some level of communication. So the authors write some great paper, they submit it for review, the reviewers get it, they discuss it, um, some decision is sent back um, you know, from the super reviewer or the program chair if it's a, if it's a conference, um, editor if it's a journal. Some super reviewer sends the response back to the author. Um, ideally, the author's paper gets published, is out there for all these readers to look at. They discuss it, they make comments, the authors can respond to the comments, and there can be this discussion um, between all three entities um, in this community. But right now, at least from a lot of things that I'm familiar with, many of these arrows, like discussion um, <laughs> and response, um, are actually missing. So what we wanted to do was just do a proof of concept to see what would it take for us to be able to have these three entities of people to be able to at least interact at a minimal at this level. Okay. So this paper mache system author has the three entities, author, and reader, and reviewer. And to us, readers and reviewers are essentially the same person, or I'm sorry, they have the same functionality. It's just that reviewers... Uh, basically, you know, can get to see the paper, uh, you know, in this draft process uh, before it's actually available for publication. And they can give various kinds of ratings in their reviews or their comments will be anonymous and not available to the general public. But they can still comment, just their level of visibility of commenting is different from, let's say, your general reader. So all of this is leading up to this notion of a, using a virtual machine, right? And so what we have is paper mache um, in terms of what I want is I would like a reviewer to have the incentive to do some level of checking of the code or checking of the software. Now what that would really mean in terms of different fields, I think that's for fields to really think about. But I think at least giving them something where they can at least do it, even if it's clicking a button and it, they run through some stuff, um, where they don't have to install something and there's a, there's a minimal amount of overhead for them to do that, it seems to me at least for that, that type of functionality, a virtual machine um, makes sense. So we have a virtual machine which includes source code, executables, data libraries, various dependencies, all that's taken care of. There's a commenting part where you can rate a paper um, instead of just rating it in your head, right? You can make it known. Um, you can write a paper, you can certainly give your review, and you can be part of an ongoing discussion, which I feel is unfortunate that that really what science is supposed to be about. It is supposed to be about this notion of sharing ideas and, sh and, and discussing and being excited about work, but right now all of that is really missing. And then we have the paper, which certainly is text and figures, but why not have some audio or even particular um, video? So let's say you're at a conference and you present your paper um, and it's videotaped. That could be linked with the paper. Um, the author could give a five minute, um, you know, sort of a, a tutorial on what the importance of the work. In other words, maybe give the paper a little bit more of a human feel so that I can at least, you know, feel like, okay, well, and actually that paper does sound interesting. I'll now dig into the details. So those are just some of the kinds of things we're thinking about when we're talking about this paper mache. Right? And so the paper mache, um, the name really comes from the fact that we wanted to take a paper and really just chop it up into these different bits of pieces. And then we wanted those different bits and pieces to have some level of executability. Right? OK, so paper mache leverages vir virtual machines. Um, if you don't know anything about virtual machines, uh, basically a virtual machine bundles an operating system, compiler, dependencies, all of that stuff into an executable environment. You can kind of think if I ran some scientific result on my computer, then I could basically bundle it all up 
um, package it, and then I could just uh, simply give it to you. And so that's the virtual machine. And then once you have a virtual machine, you need to have something that actually runs that virtual machine. And so that's actually called a hypervisor. So I'm going to give a little demo. And in a demo, we built all our uh, VMs from the available source. And in terms of our hypervisor, we just use virtual, um, virtual box. All right. So basically, what this means is that instead of this traditional stuff, which requires seven steps, you have, and it's not just solely just paper mache, it's any approach that would use a VM um, type of an approach, would be you would install your VM hypervisor. You'd only have to do that once, if that's virtual box, if that's parallels, um, so forth. You would uh, get the VM or virtual machine that you're interested in, you download it on your machine, and then from there you can play with the VM, or you can play what's inside of the VM um, in order to run your experiments. Okay. So a lot fewer steps. All right, so I'm going to give a quick demonstration. So in this demonstration, I wanted to show just a few things. Um, one of them, again, remember, I wanted to think of this as a paper management system, almost something that maybe a publisher would be interested in using. So we want to be able to search for papers. Uh, we like to be able to download and interact with the virtual machines. We'd obviously like to be able to interact with the figures, although right now in our proof of concept, that's uh, very, very limited. Um, if I get a virtual machine, I'd like to modify it, and by modifying it, that means that whatever application, source code, scripts, I should be able to modify those in some way, save them um, uh, for my own personal um, use, let's say, for example, after publication, if that's the, the case. Um, you know, download citations, uh, certainly. Um, and then more importantly, this notion of starting to have some notion of community. So, you know, at the very simple, in terms of you thinking about blogs and newspaper articles or uh, news, news posts, being able to comment um, and rate papers um, would seem at the very least things we could do to enhance some level of uh, community with scientific papers. Okay. So, I kind of went through that. Let's see if I can get to the demo here. So here's our web page here, web server, I guess. Actually, it's all running locally on my machine. Um, but it's paper mache, executable bits of paper. Um, nothing really too special in terms of design. Essentially, here on the left side, you have various things. We have a tutorial to help you, um, you know, if you figure out how to use it. And then in the middle of the page, we would have, for example, maybe the newest papers or featured papers. Um, and then you can certainly click on them to get more information. And then here we have pictures really which are showing the VM that uh, was used in order to create the results that are in the uh, paper. Um, there's a search uh, feature uh, where basically you can search for articles as you normally would. And also if you're just interested in searching for papers that have a virtual machine, you can um, just basically uh, do that as well. So let me just uh, stay on this page here. Um, I have a collaborator um, here at the University of British Columbia in computer science, um, Anne Condon and her students. So I'm going to feature a little bit of uh, their work here. So they wrote this paper, Improved Free Energy Parameters for RNA Suited Knotted Secondary Structure Prediction. Um, and so uh, that actually appeared uh, recently. And here what we'd like to do in this paper management system is be able to display the paper, uh, any copyright notices or whatever. Um, and then we'd have a bar here that talks about the executable bits. And here they're very basic, where really the most executable bit portion is the actual virtual machine. So the software that this particular paper is featuring is something called Hot Knots. And so that's why we call it this Hot Knots virtual machine. Um, basically, you can go and you can look at the paper. You can click on different parts if you're just interested in something. Um, and then at the bottom here, you can leave some comment um, about, the, about the paper. We had to write that, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> so in any case, um, but the idea is, is that, you know, you can, you can, if you're an author, you can go and you can look at comments and you can respond to them if you choose. And the thing is, we're all very used to this from doing this with blogs or whatever, but this very simple feature functionality is typically missing when we're talking about a scientific paper. And I think when we're talking about reproducibility, the more we can get people to interact 
with a paper, the more likely people are going to be interested in the actual things underneath the hood of the um, scientific paper. Okay. Um, and there's other things, you know, we can do. My students were like, oh, let's put Facebook and all this stuff, but I don't know. Facebook and science, I'm not sure. Is that being recorded? <laughs> all right, so what do I want to do now? Okay, so if you go to this downloadable, uh, executable links, we can download the virtual machine, but I'm not going to do that. Um, basically, we tried to create a virtual machine with, the, with as little as possible. Um, there was an earlier um, talk that talks about actually, um, you know, potentially, you know, having, uh, using that as a way to create a minimal virtual machine, and we probably should look at that. Um, but the virtual machine uh, that we created, I think, was about a gigabyte, and then we compressed it, so now it's about half of a gig. So this download is probably about half of a gig or something like that. Uh, compressed, and then you'd have to uncompress it uh, to get the virtual machine. So let's just say I've compressed it. So here I go to VirtualBox. <clears throat> which is my hypervisor, which is basically um, going to be used to run uh, my virtual machine. Here I have a lot of different um, virtual machines um, that are available, something called MizRF, uh, TreeZip, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then there's one that I'm really interested in, which is this HotMoss, which is a, basically the virtual machine for that uh, paper that I just showed you. So within this um, environment, you can just start it, and it will start just like a regular um, machine. We'll just wait. Hopefully, it shouldn't take so long. <clears throat> and essentially, it's going to start up the operating system here. Uh, we're going to be using Ubuntu 10.10. Um, and then I'm going to show you uh, a few little things with that. <clears throat> so every time I see this, I'm thinking, why do I live in Texas? All right. <laughs> so anyway, so here we have a uh, hot and virtual machine. And we have some um, you know, little icons uh, just for this demo uh, where I'm going to actually show you a few things. So here I'm going to open up the uh, web page for Hot Knots. And Hot Knots, if you look, it did the best thing, right? It has a web page. It has you know, how to download the source code. You can get the data and results and all those things. So we did that. And if we run this, it says, cannot open desired font. So it compiles, but it doesn't execute. Because it turns out, when, you, when we go to Ubuntu 10.10, there's some fonts now that are now no longer open source that actually this particular hot mouse code is required to handle. So I'm just thinking, if I'm even a software person, it's like, I don't even want to deal with any font issues. I want like a real error, right? <laughs> so. Anyway, we fixed it, obviously. And basically, you know, it produces, um, in their case, they're producing an RNA strand. Um, you can kind of see this here, which is a PS file. But the point is, is that, you know, if I was an interested reviewer, the idea would be I could maybe look into that script, or as an author, I could do a little bit more to help a reviewer to be able to look at, well, okay, these results seem okay a level of, you know, a very detailed level of reproducibility with all the other tools, I'm not sure if that's what we want at the reviewing level. Maybe that's something for the community. But I think at the very least, something that allows a, a, a low obstacle for reviewers to at least be able to just say they click something or do something more than not even being um, interested. Okay. So. That's all I really want to show. And of course, within the virtual machine, all the stuff related to the hot knots code is in there for those of us who um, are interested in such, such things, right? OK. So before I move on, are there any questions? Because I'm going to go to a second part of my, my talk. But my main point here is, is that you know, this paper mache, like I said, was really thought of in terms of being this paper management system for authors, reviewers, and readers to originally build some level of community. And so, you know, so here for me, reproducibility is really more in terms of how can we get people to even consider to actually look into a person's um, results. And that may not necessarily mean at the surgery level, like a lot of the other approaches we had were talking about. Once I'm interested in the work, now I may want to actually do surgery. But at first, I need to have some level of interest, and that interest probably is going to come from me using my own data 
on the person's code and being satisfied, trying some parameters, and then it's like, okay, cool. And then from there, I can decide, do I want to do more? Okay. So I do have a question. Back in the, back in the paper mache, so this was the VM. Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the paper mache uh, website? <coughs> so you had download executable bits, hot ops virtual machine. Mm -hmm. what, what are the executable bits that are the figures and the bits? Yeah, so right now the figures aren't interactive. The figures basically is just um, a tar file of the PDF uh, figures. So if you look at here, um, basically, it's, it, they've already um, um, untarded for you, but it's really just a collection of okay, PDFs. So it's not, so it's not, of, so it's, not it's, it's not interactive, correct? Yeah. Um, but we're just using it as a placeholder because we like that piece to be something where people can interact. So we're just showing it as a as a placeholder. But at the moment, you cannot interact. Okay. Yes. So the first time you ran the, the first time you clicked the button to run hot you had an error that something mm -hmm. missing. So it makes me wonder, what, what are you allowed to distribute with the VM? So, um, I guess you have to be very careful about what you distribute with the VM. Yeah. Like, yeah, so I think all of the, I mean, I think that's just a general question for the community as a whole. Um, in terms of when we're talking about packaging up things, how do we make sure that the person has the correct licenses to be able to use the software that we're packaging up? Um, so that's not, not something just related to VM. It's for anything that's going to package up an executable environment. How do you make sure that they have the licenses to be able to use it? Some people try to get around this by using the cloud, but even that can be hairy because with a license for a cloud, is it for a single user or is it for a community of users? So this licensing thing to me is when we're talking about software is a huge problem. Um, and so at least with the hot knots, for example, they aren't using any uh, external software. Everything that they did is from scratch or, you know, um, uh, under the correct license. So this isn't a problem for their in environment. But if you're using something, for example, where you're producing plots and you're using MATLAB, co or your MATLAB code, well, in your virtual machine, you probably don't want to have MATLAB in there or you want to take it out or something so that, or, or force it so that another person has to use there. Now, one thing I'll show you um, that's really an amazing feature with Windows um, <laughs> is, uh, so Windows is interesting because, you know, you can actually, um, you know, create a virtual machine that uses Windows as an operating system, right? So then when I give it to you, right, you have to have a license, right? So Windows actually has a command called sysprep where it actually strips away the licensing info from the OS. And so now when I give it to you, you have to type in your own licensing, um, you know, licensing info, and at that point you can use Windows, right? So if we had ways in which we could, if there is commercial software or, or something, if we had ways to strip away licensing information so that the other person has to put in the correct license or the license for them, that can get us, uh, get us out of a lot of the sticky situations. And for Windows, there is the sysprep that allows you to do that. And you're allowed to distribute the VM with Windows installed. But you can't use it unless you type in the license. The license. Yep. So, you know, it'd be great. I can't believe it. Was, but it'd be great if other software, we could be able to do that, is strip away any kind of licensing information. But until you can do that, you do have to be careful about if you take a VM or any of the other methods that package up things, you know, you distribute it out there, how do you make sure that you don't get yourself into, into problems with licensing? And to me, it seems like it could be nice if we could have a way to remove a license information as one way in which Windows is doing. Okay. It's a broader problem. It's a broader problem. But it's something, I mean, we have to figure out at, at some point. Right. All right. Any other questions? Okay. The other thing about the VM, and I know, you know, we're, we were talking a little bit about, you know, there are certain kinds of things you're just not going to be able uh, to, you know, reproduce. So, for example, you know, if you are on some huge cluster, well, of course, I'm not going to necessarily be able to reproduce that if I'm not on that particular um, environment. But one thing I do like about virtual machines, or at least the way VirtualBox does it, let's look at this one, um, is at the very least, I don't know if you've ever tried to install parallel software, but it's like a million times harder than sequential. <laughs> and so at least if I had it installed on, in the, you know, I have a multi-core system, 
I have it installed, it's ready to go. I can at least see how it works. For example, you know, if I change the number of cores that I'm, you know, able to use. I think a lot of times with parallel machines, we don't even, even try to reproduce anything because trying to get it to work on a particular platform is even way more difficult than it is, let's say, for a sequential um, machine. The other thing I like about virtual machines, and there's certainly nothing really special about our work, but just virtual machines, is it has a way for you to constrain the environment. So you might be like, hey, well, of course this works well. It's using, you know, such and such amount of memory. But if it were used less, it would have such and such problem. So you almost kind of have an experimental environment within the virtual machine in terms of the actual computational environment beyond just the parameter and things like that of the software. So I think those are really kind of an interesting aspect of using virtual machines, not necessarily just in terms of reproducibility, but just sort of thinking about the range in which the results are relevant, right? Is it really because of the computational platform, or is it really because the idea actually has a lot of merit? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Uh, VirtualBox itself has problems with uh, multiple cores on well, it's okay for a few. I, mean, it, I agree with you, virtual box or a virtual environment is the way to go, but it's, it's not cool. All right, all right, but I mean, I think a lot of these things, right? I mean, you know, you know, there's a reason why this bar is red or orange, right? Because it's kind of like, don't go there. <laughs> um, because, you know, you don't know what your results are going to be. But I think the point is, is that once a community starts seeing something as potentially being useful, then we actually improve upon it, right? But right now, we actually, as a, you know, we're still trying out different things, so there really is no need to improve what we already have. But if something actually is useful, Right, now all of a sudden now there becomes this motivation to actually make that thing better. Yeah. Yeah. Now the other thing I do like about VirtualBox, or at least other ones, is underneath it is this uh, hypervisor called Zen, which isn't as easy, user friendly, but it has all the source code and things like that you, you need if you wanted to basically write your own front end instead of using VirtualBox. So, uh, so you don't have to really use VirtualBox, because all of them, VirtualBox parallels all of them, from what I can see uses this other layer called Zen, and you really could do stuff from there if you cared and wanted something uh, special for your particular kind of uh, solution. All right, any other questions? Okay, I have a few minutes, so I want to just talk about something a bit different. <clears throat> Should I talk? Okay, I uh, will skip all this. Um, so essentially with paper mache, I, I would say if we don't need special hardware or if we have any special uh, requirements, I think we should just consider doing our science directly in the virtual machine, basically create a virtual machine or separate virtual machine for each research project. There's many methods that were talked um, earlier today where you could take that environment and then organize it. Because right now if you just use the virtual machine, nothing is really organized. People will still have to go in there and try to find stuff. But I think this could really work well with a lot of different things that we've talked about um, before. Um, certainly there's this cloud um, perspective. Um, and then this other notion of how can we, I mean, even if, even if we have the virtual machine, I mean, how much more do we need to do in order to encourage the community to participate more in the scientific process? Okay. So my last thing I want to talk about is what level of reproducibility is impactful for science? We have this part where it's like, I want to know everything you did since you thought about the problem. <laughs> and then there's this other part is, I just want to see the single path that you took to get uh, to whatever it is you're producing. And the question is, you know, what level, what is it do we mean by reproducibility? How much information is enough for us to consider that something is validated? All right. So I, it's something completely uh, outside of the scope of CS anyway. So this application is from human variation studies. And here we have the skull sizes of primates, human, chimpanzee, uh, orangutan, and so forth. And the thing is, is that if we think about the, and so you can see there's different skull sizes and, you know, back in the 1800s or 1700s or whatever, the idea was whoever had the biggest uh, skull size was the more intelligent being. So the thing was, if we pick a particular species, let's say human, and there is variation in skull sizes for human beings, what, if anything, do these different skull sizes represent? So there are two people in this little story. There is Samuel George Morton and Stephen Jay Gould. Both of them um, are no longer with us. But Morton in the 1800s 
he believed that cranial capacity demonstrated the capacity for civilization. That is, the larger the skull, the more intelligent and the more civilized. Gould, he was, grew up in the civil rights movement and things like that. He hated what Morton stood for, and so his views were quite different from Morton. So Morton, in 1839, wrote this book, or this massive tome, Crania Americana, and he came up with these conclusions, Caucasians have bigger heads and smarter, blacks have smaller heads and not as smart, and so on and so forth, right? And so Morton's work was part of this wider movement, um, and it was very influential, especially because it fit with the time, with the, um, I would say, the thoughts of that particular time period. Now Gould, in 1981, wrote a, or at least maybe it was 1979, he wrote an article in Science blasting apart Morton's findings. It was just like, this is wrong, this makes no sense, so on and so forth. And then he wrote a second, uh, and then he turned that chapter into a book, which is The Mismeasure of Man, which was published in 1981. And then he wrote a second edition of that um, in 1996. So what Gould did was he reanalyzed Morton's data, and he was like, there's no way you can come to these conclusions that, the, you know, that there's any differences between these skull sizes, and as a result, there's no differences in intelligence among these, these different races, races in which you say they exist. And so Gould has suggested that Morton's social prejudice led him to these unconscious biases, and so on and so forth. And if you, you know, maybe in your science classes, you may have had to read Miss Measure of Man, it's a very, very famous book. It's very seminal in the sense that Gold's analysis became a classic for how prejudice can distort scientific results. Right? I even read the book. But then, last month, in uh, Plus Biology, there was a group, um, Lewis et al., that claimed that most of Gould's criticisms were poorly supported or falsified. And what they did was they said, you know, and even Gould says in his book, Gould basically took Morton's data and reanalyzed it. Lewis et al., they took the original skulls and they remeasured those, right? So they remeasured the original skulls and then they did various analyses and then they said, well, actually Morton's conclusions about difference in skull sizes is okay. It's not necessarily that it's okay about what, the, what, what judgment that result is, is, but the fact that there are different skull sizes that's probably okay. Now what that means in terms of intelligence, that's not what they were trying to test. They were just trying to test whether his methodology was actually okay. So they also checked Gould's method, because you know it's written, and they said they discovered no consistent bias in Morton's work, but found that Gould had unwittingly or by design distorted the evidence potentially based on his political views. So, our summary here is that what would have happened if Morton had not saved all of the data he collected? These skulls, there's hundreds of skulls. Actually, he never really collected those skulls personally. He had these friends who had skulls that he, <laughs> 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 that he got them from. Kind of makes you wonder. Um, but the thing was, the book was huge because he meticulously wrote down how he measured the skulls. He used two different methods to measure skulls. One with seeds, the other with uh, lead or something. And the thing was, initially he, he did the seed way of measuring skulls, and he would measure them many times, but there would be too, many, too much variation between his measurements, and so he wanted to do something better. And so then he went to this lead thing, and even when he went to the lead, he decided at that point he was not going to have an assistant to help him redo, to do those measurements. When he had the seeds, I think he had some graduate student or something, right, um, who basically was doing the measurements and he was not so satisfied with those measurements, right? So even though he may have had these views about intelligence of beings, you know, that was in the context of the, of the time he lived, but he still was very meticulous about his methodology, which shouldn't be a refunction of the time, right? Outcomes of science are a function of time. The methodology should be... Um, should, should not be in terms, of, uh, in terms of how well it's done. So Gould did his analysis based on Morton's calculation of skull sizes. Lewitt et al. did their analysis by performing new measurements. The question is, is one better than the other? Are they both useful? And so the point I want to make about reproducibility is that reproducibility is essential in order for science to be self-correcting. Whatever hypotheses we get out of science, they really are going to be a function of the time in which we live. And as our views change, so will our, our judgments about various kinds of results um, that we made. 
And also, reproducibility keeps scientific results alive. No, the, the point that no one can go back and look at your work, to me, that at that point, your work is dead. Okay. All right, so you know, we believe paper mache is an interesting system, novel system, uh, for creating um, dynamic executable papers. Of course, it's many, many things to still be desired. It scratches the surface. Uh, we need a lot of ideas which are coming from this great workshop. Um, basically, this example from human variation study shows an intriguing example of the value of reproducibility. Um, another part I think we think about re reproducibility is if we ask interesting questions, potentially even controversial, as well as doing novel work, um, in other words, doing those things to get interest um, in reproducibility, re reproducing results. And, you know, as we've been saying, reproducible work is the key to impactful work, allows the self-correction aspect of science to happen, and gives everyone an opportunity to participate in discovery. That's all I have. Special thanks to Ann Condon, the students, my friend Mark, and then um, me and my students who are smiling, so that's a good thing, right? <laughs> okay. All right. We have not, we don't have this little, um, right now, we have to be the ones to put your VM into the system. So we don't have a module for the author to go ahead and basically take what they have and without us being involved, putting their VM in the paper mache system. So that's kind of like our next step is to basically, once you have your VM, to put together a set of process, some automatic process to help you bundle all that up and automatically deposit it into a paper mache like system. The, the, the VM is, is the main part. strictly supplemental material in the sense that the article can be read without the VM and mm -hmm. the VM can be executed mm -hmm. without yeah, the they're, they're, they're Yeah, they're, they're not intertwined. Really not at the moment, no. You're right. Yes. Right. So there's not, like some of the people talked about code and figure at that level. Um, at this level, um, no. We don't, have, we don't have that. Or at least the system doesn't support that. That doesn't mean it can't be done. Okay. Any other questions? Questions? Okay, okay. thank you. Okay.